in all of the time I was growing up before we ever heard of climate change, these birds spent the winter from about southern Illinois down to southern Florida. Now they don't even winter in Florida anymore and they winter up into Wisconsin in fairly big numbers. And so it's thought that the warming climate is making it easier for them to winter farther north and maybe make it so that they can't winter in the really warm places like Florida. One kind of example that we were, are thinking about with climate change is a bird like this scarlet tanager. When birds, this is a bird that spends the summers up in the northern part of the United States, like around here, and then spends the winters all the way south in South America. And the, what is thought to be the stimulus for that bird leaving South America to come back to the United States is the ever-increasing day length that happens as, as summer approaches, or in the case of South America, as the day is getting shorter, these birds, it stimulates their migrating north. Now, if the insects that they feed on in the north are responding to temperature rather than day length and climate is getting warmer, then those insects may come out before these birds get back and then their food source is going to be gone and they may starve when they get here. So there are a lot of people thinking a lot about those kinds of problems for birds. And all of this is important because because a lot of these things do end up affecting us. I mean, some of them are the, the plants that those deer are eating are the things that take carbon out of the atmosphere. And so, you know, you can see how it's incredibly complex and, and something that if you start perturbing any one part of it, you may be upsetting the whole thing. Fish are important to people for many reasons, uh, partly because people eat them, they're an important food source. Uh, fish are also important indicators of environmental health. That is, if you have a particular group of fishes living in a stream or a river, you can then assess whether that river or stream is polluted or not. So they're indicators of how healthy the environment is around us. How does climate change affect fish's food source? So fishes eat uh, either little tiny bugs or plants or other types of things. And with climate change, it may very well be that there will be different species of food out there. And if their preferred food disappears because of climate change, then those fish will start to starve and will have less to eat, and then they may disappear. The primary way that climate change is going to affect the fish's environment is through temperature. Fish are very sensitive to temperature. They can, some can only live at very cold water, some can live at warmer water. So as climate change happens and the earth gets warmer, the water will also get warmer and certain fish will not be able to survive in certain streams if it gets too warm. So one of the ways that climate change is affecting the food sources of ants is that as some places become warmer, we know that the food sources that they once fed on are no longer available. And in other places where it's getting cooler, which is why we call it global climate change instead of global warming, we know that the plants and animals that once lived there are also going extinct. So as their food sources go extinct, so do the native ant populations. One of the ways in which ants are important to us is that ants are responsible for turning more soil than earthworms. We also know that ants disperse the seeds of many plants. So one of the things that makes ants really unique in the animal world is they live in complex societies where you have lots of individuals that are all functioning for the greater good or whole. So one of the things that has been predicted, if all of the ants were to disappear tomorrow, we know that ants are involved in not only just soil turning, but in the degradation and breakdown of all the material that sort of builds up on a daily basis. So they say that if ants were to disappear tomorrow, within about four months, the entire planet would be completely non-inhabitable for humans. Climate change can really impact the amount of rainfall that is received in an area, that will affect the uh, development of the soil, it will affect the organisms that can grow in the soil. Uh, it can also impact the, uh, the area around it. The, the temperature of the soil uh, will really affect the organisms that are in there. If it's too cold, the organisms won't be able to produce and grow well, or it will just be adapted to certain kinds of organisms. And so uh, uh, the climate of the soil or the, the uh, condition of the soil can impact the kind of organisms that grow in the soil. 
Well, uh, most of our food has some connection to the soil. Our crops uh, grow in the soil and our animals that we have um, depend upon the, uh, the food that grows in the soil too. Soil uh, can absorb a lot of uh, heat and a lot of carbon and can uh, hold that carbon that's extra in the atmosphere. If we have a, a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the soil can be a storage for a lot of that carbon. Urban environments uh, lack areas for many organisms to, to thrive and live, so Northern Island acts in that regard to uh, maintain a habitat for you know, a multitude of different organisms. There have been many studies done that connect 15 of the 24 most prevalent um, mental and physical illnesses to people who don't live um, or, or, or are able to have access to park space. Um, as far as um, a little less scientific, I would say um, the lakefront and then Northerly Island in particular provides people a place to bike, run, and swim. Um, as far as that type of real estate, like right on a major lake, it's pretty much the only city in the country that provides that to its public. Most, most other cities um, devote their lakefront area to in industry and, and, and private companies, so Chicago is definitely unique in that aspect. By having park space, you're attracting organizations, companies, academics, professionals to come to a city such as Chicago to put up shop, to um, to live and work, basically. There's this great interrelationship between insects, birds, mammals, all of these things that's very tightly intertwined. And if you take one of those threads out, you don't know what's going to happen to the whole rest of the fabric. So in regards to Northerly Island and Lakefront Park Space, um, I think uh, that the city should go by the mantra, if you build it, they will come. Well, I, I think that the biggest things that we can do is, is, is what everybody in the environment move it, move, movement suggests, which is to try to cut down on our own energy usage, our own carbon emissions, and you know, not drive when we don't have to, take a bike if you can. And, um, and we also just need, need to um, do our best to help protect habitat. So anything that we can do that keeps habitat there and that helps reduce the kinds of pollution that, that are causing climate change is the, the best we can do at the moment.